Hi, new residents. I'm Dr. Robert Estrell. I'm a transplant surgeon and an associate dean for undergraduate medical education. Uh, the presentation that you will soon see is on interprofessional collaboration and communication with transplant team members uh, given for new interns. And the goal is to have optimal uh, quality patient care and patient safety. It's important that you watch this entire presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be questions that we want you to answer, and we want to see your perspective from these questions. So thank you very much for participating on the panel. Um, I would just like everybody to introduce themselves, um, get their title and their role. Hi, my name is Crystal Johnson Bryant, and I'm a licensed master social worker within the transplant department at University Hospital. And my job is to conduct comprehensive psychosocial evaluation to patients being referred to transplant and live organ donation. My name is Reed Hall. I'm a pharmacist on the transplant team. Uh, we participate in multidisciplinary rounds, protocol development, implementation, uh, and adherence. Um, and education of uh, surgical staff, pharmacy staff, um, <clears throat> and um, patients. Hi, my name is David Hawkridge. I'm a third year surgery resident. Uh, I've served as the intern and second year on the transplant surgery services. Uh, as an intern, uh, I was the kind of the hub of uh, patient care, bringing all the teams together. Uh, and as a second year, uh, really focused on ICU care and uh, uh, surgical technique. Hi everyone, my name is Alina Ghani. I am a fourth year surgery res resident at UTESCA. Um, I have the fortune of uh, being on transplant service as an intern, as a junior resident, and recently as a senior resident. Um, as an intern, I've done the groundwork, seen the patients, um, taken care of uh, their needs, and um, done documentation, talking to different teams about their patient care. Um, and as a second, second year resident and a fourth year resident, I have participated in um, operations. I have been on procurements and uh, it's been exciting. Hi, I'm Mark Dedman. I've been in medicine for 33 years, starting as an Army medic. I've uh, been a, I was an Army PA and I've been a PA for 21 years with the last 18 years on this transplant team. Over the years, I think I've done everything there is to do on the transplant team, but now I'm primarily in the outpatient clinic. Hi all, my name is Erica Suniga. I am a transplant surgical care coordinator and also um, when time allows, I do inpatient discharge teaching for our transplant patients. Um, I've been here for 16, 17 years with transplant um, and I love it. Hi, my name is Tatiana Cardenas and I am a recent general surgery residency uh, graduate from the program here at UT Health in San Antonio. Um, I'm a board certified general surgeon and I am currently uh, in my fellowship training for surgical critical care and trauma. I've uh, served in the role of intern PGY2 as well as chief resident uh, on the transplant service, so I'm um, happy to be here. Thank you very much for the introductions. Um, I really just want to thank you all for participating on our panel today. Um, when we discuss really the importance of interprofessional communication for new interns on the transplant team, um, really to, de to deliver quality patient care and, and safe patient care. Um, an interprofessional approach to patient care has really been uh, implemented effectively in many um, clinical settings. And I'm biased, you know, as a transplant surgeon because the transplant team really does this exceedingly well. Um, as a transplant surgeon, I feel extremely fortunate to work with an incredible gifted and talented uh, group of healthcare providers um, who deliver, you know, superb care to very complex patients. Um, and I could not work with a better team of surgery trainees and diverse healthcare providers to really provide the highest quality care that we can to our transplant patients. So thank you all for serving on the panel today. Um, this is really just an open uh, discussion. Um, we want open, interactive discussion for several questions that I'll pose to you. Um, and we'll start with the first one. So what do you think are the best characteristics of, effective, of an effective transplant team? The best characteristics of an effective transplant team. 
I think in the on any team, the number one thing you have to have is communication. Mm -hmm. You know, without communication, everything else is going to fall through the cracks. Most mm -hmm. problems are probably due to a lack of communication. So, um, the more communication you can have from <clears throat> the attending surgeon or hepatologist, nephrologist, mm -hmm. through the team, throughout the entire continuity of care mm -hmm. of the patient, uh, you know, I think the better the patient's going to do and the more cohesive your team's going to mm -hmm. be. Any other thoughts? I think also mm -hmm. knowing who, who to communicate with, mm -hmm. especially on the transplant mm -hmm. service. Definitely. Um, it's a very intricate service that mm -hmm. lots of things have to happen on a daily mm -hmm. basis um, so I think knowing not only the people on your team with regards to the resident team or your faculty members but I mean everyone case managers mm -hmm. you know transplant coordinators the pharmacists I mean all these people are really integral in um, the patient in patient care especially on that service so I think that's knowing the infrastructure of the entire team is is important yeah I think playing off of that um, I think uh, what I found as an intern as a second year was that everybody, probably more than any other service, like the transplant faculty of all the different team and all the different team members really are caring for the patient in a multidisciplinary way and they understand that. And that everybody likes to have the information no matter how minuscule or how small it is. Um, they, they like knowing all the details and all the facts. Um, even if it pertains to somebody else's. So I think just kind of being upfront, open about everything and not being the only person that knows about something I think can definitely help. <clears throat> I'll agree to all of that. And I think one more thing that I'll add is an atmosphere where anyone can question anyone anything. Mm -hmm. I remember being a junior resident on a transplant team. And, you know, sometimes as new residents, you kind of think, shall I be asking this question? I might sound stupid. Mm -hmm. I might sound like I don't know what I'm doing. But I think we really need to be promoting that atmosphere mm -hmm. where everybody feels safe about asking Absolutely. any kind of question related mm -hmm. to patient care. And not being shy about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so you know, even if uh, the person you're asking may not know the answer, but they know someone who does, mm -hmm. and they can connect the two together and, say, and facilitate that good communication mm -hmm. all the way around. Sure. Any other thoughts? Well, I could just want to add, um, when I was on service on the inpatient side, we had rounds twice a day um, in the morning and the afternoon, and we would always be in and out of each other's offices and texting one another, so it's like not only twice a day, but throughout the whole day, and it's like you all were saying, any little detail, what's going on, you know, from them being admitted to them being discharged, constant communication the whole time. So. I think from the, you know, incoming interns on our <coughs> team, I think they need you know, y'all need to realize that we are there as a resource. We're there to teach you. We're there to take care of patients, and we're there to you know help you get through this rotation because it's busy. And and so you know, use us as a resource, um, and and it will make your life a whole lot easier. I think. <clears throat> I think if we're community together as a team, then when we speak to our patients, we have the same information that we're giving yeah. the patient. Mm -hmm. So that's important Everybody's too. Not just case. us talking mm -hmm. as a team, but we also talking to the patient or make, giving them the same information where they feel comfortable <clears throat> with what we're saying. Communication seems like a very important part of an effective team. Are there any other characteristics? Be respectful to each other. Mm -hmm. Respectful of folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just know that everybody, there's so many people on the team that have these specialties and they're very good at what they do mm -hmm. and rely on that huge wealth of knowledge that's, that's available to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter who they are, whatever position they have on the team, what they bring to the team, nobody else is bringing. And so it's, it really uh, expounds upon the ability to take care of the patient. Being willing and able, I think, also to do whatever needs to be done for patient care. Um, in terms of, you know, there are a few times where, you know, the interns are overloaded or the PGY2 is off doing a procurement. I just finished getting out of the OR with, you know, something and there's, you know, a bunch of patients that need to be discharged. The chief needs to do discharges. <laughs> and so I found myself, you know, that you, that's what you do. You do what you need to do um, to get the work done. So. See the challenges of the day and... Yeah. No matter. Yeah, things need to get done no matter what. Is, you mm -hmm. need to get things done. Bitch in. Anything else? <clears throat> 
So the next question is really directed particularly to the surgery trainees. Um, given the different roles of the surgery trainees on the <coughs> transplant team, how should the surgery trainees communicate amongst themselves and with transplant healthcare providers to provide the best quality care? Because there are hierarchies in the, sure. in the um, residence with every team. I think it was kind of already touched upon, but you know, you have to have a good understanding of um, what is more not e emergent and what is emergent mm -hmm. or urgent. And you have to kind of tailor uh, how and who you are communicating to based on that. Mm -hmm. If there was something emergent that didn't have time to go through the grapevine, I would have gone straight to the faculty or called the faculty, and they're appreciative of me understanding that that's always a possibility. For something that's a little bit smaller that you have a little question on that's not gonna, you know, delay or hinder patient care, then, you know, I think you kind of climb the ladder a little bit and uh, use all your different resources, uh, whether that's your senior level residents or you know, the mid-levels, the pharmacists, the nurses, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of people on the team that have a lot of years of experience that can, that can help you. Um, so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other comments? Um, yeah, as a, so being the first year, the second year, and then the chief last year on the service, uh, I think it's super important um, to let your team know where you are. And so the interns and the junior level residents need to be able to ask their chiefs, hey, where are you gonna be? Because you could be across the state. You could be across the hall <laughs> or just downstairs in the operating room. But it, you need to be able to let them know because they need to have a way of getting in touch with you or you know, if you're going to procurement, say, you know, hey, give me a call on my cell phone or page me so that the OR nurse can answer my pager. I always tried to uh, let my team know where I was at all times, um, just so that they knew where the most effective way to communicate with me. You know, call directly into the OR, come to the OR, or you know, I, I think that's that's huge um, because that, all that I think the how effective a team communicates comes from. I think the essentially the leader of that team, and so with that, you know, I think those initial conversations to know your whereabouts. Exactly. Is that done face to face, or is it done by a phone call, or by by text? Uh, I usually. How do residents communicate these days? I, I, at the beginning <laughs> of the day, <laughs> I, it's, it is variable. Yeah. At the beginning of the day, you know, before rounds, there's sort of like a plan, you know, hey, this is what's going on today. We may have a procurement. This is where I'll be. This is where, you know, David will be. And this is where, you know, intern is. So if you have any questions, there, you know, David's going to be off at a procurement. So don't call him. I'll be in the sure. building, you know, or it just, I think initially those should be had face to face. And then a lot of text messaging and phone calls and stuff from there on. I mean, text messaging is a very effective means of communication as long as everybody on your team understands that when you send some sort of information, you're expecting a, okay, yes, understand, I'm on it, no problem, you know, we'll figure it out. Um, that is critical. Um, it's an acknowledgement that you're it, Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to circle back to the yeah. Yeah. sender. Yeah. Positive feedback. Closed loop, yeah, closed loop communication. With a phone yeah. call or with a direct uh, communication with the other person, you get that. Um, but text message is a little bit unique. So it's really important to, uh, to have that closed loop uh, communication to acknowledge that you received the text message because mm -hmm. I'd probably say like 5% of text messages don't go through or, you know, it's getting better. But... It's always a worry. Also, should never, never. ever Your text message. be a text message. <laughs> yeah. um, it needs to be a phone call or an up face to face conversation yeah. yes. with someone that is up the ladder. Mm -hmm. I think um, the communication changes as you progress along your surgical training. Um, I realize the importance of it when I've been a senior resident on complex services like transplant or trauma. 
a plan might be clear in my head and I might communicate that I want this done for the patient, but my junior level resident or the intern might not know why I'm saying that and they might not realize the significance of it. They like take the time out to explain that this is what I saw in the patient this morning, this is what the labs are showing, and this is what I'm worried about, Thereby, that's why I want to do this. So I think taking those few seconds out to explain to the junior mm -hmm. residents really helps them to um, realize what we are thinking and where we are heading. Especially when that happens early in the academic year. Exactly, for, for because the, yeah, because they have not seen enough to realize mm -hmm. the same things the that first we are realizing. Time on the transplant service. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I thought y'all used Snapchat, and Twitter. Look at this liver. <laughs> The next question, how do you learn about each other's roles in the delivery of patient care? I, mean, I think a lot of it's experience. <laughs> yeah. um, asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, as an intern, as you kind of progress through your second, third year, working at different hospitals, you learn quickly who you should ask to and get whatever answer you're looking for. Um, and so as a new intern, ask a lot of questions. Uh, it was already said before, but even if the person you're asking doesn't know, they know who to who you should be asking. And that, that's, that can be a big resource. Um, I, I don't know. I don't yeah, think I think it's just something that you learn with time. <coughs> like you realize, okay, if I have this kind of a question, who's the best person to ask? Mm -hmm. uh, or it would be social work, so let's just call them. Sure. Or pharmacy is the biggest resource here. Mm -hmm. Let me just call sure. them and straighten this out with them. So I think it just comes with experience and working with the same team over and over again. Mm -hmm. Doesn't well, make don't be afraid ahead. to ask. I think mm -hmm. a lot of maybe, you know, um, medical students or interns or second years, maybe not chiefs, but, you know, they do, they're afraid to ask or intimidated. Um, and I guess for us, um, try not to be so intimidating, you know, <laughs> you know, try to um, start the conversation with, my name is such and such, and this is what I do. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. So, I mean, every service is very unique, and I think transplant is very unique. Um, just with my position, I mean, I don't think anyone in this hospital has the position where I do take care of all the transplant stuff. So that's very unique. Where usually residents are the ones are, that are posting cases versus a nurse posting cases. So that's, you know, ask the questions. And for us, healthcare personnel, to be open and willing to um, let them know what we do. Yeah. I was going to say, on the in, um, inpatient side, having rounds twice a day where it's multidisciplinary, there's a lot of times where the resident was like, well, I don't know who, but, and then they'll mm -hmm. say it. So even if it's insignificant to bring it up. And as a social worker, we take care of all of the non-medical. So we're the only non-medical, right, professional for the most part um, in a healthcare setting. So we just take care of, a lot of times people have no idea what a social worker does. And I've had sometimes a resident or even a family member saying, well, tell me what you, what you can do, right? And then I'll tell you if I need your assistance. So we do anything and everything uh, psychosocial related. So I have wrote letters to the Mexican embassy or the consulate. I've talked to probation officers. I've we write a lot of letters, anything to do with mental health, substance use, legal, anything like that would be a social worker. So it's a very interesting job. <laughs> you know, I think we try to provide guidance as to who you need to go to when things need to get done. You know, And so a lot of times <clears throat> I'll tell the intern, look, you need to give the case manager a prescription for this drug at this dose for this amount of time. Mm -hmm. And you need to do that sooner than later because it's going to require a prior authorization, which is going to take time, which means a patient mm -hmm. can't go home. And so, <clears throat> you know, I think we'll try and provide you some of that information and, and some of that guidance. Like, look, this is what you need to accomplish your goal of, of sending that mm -hmm. patient out. So if you want them to get home, you know, we need X, Y, and Z done, and then we'll take care of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so I think there's a lot that the is learned just kind of through mm -hmm. some of that and then i think as the chiefs come on and stuff that um usually they're pretty good at like look you know this is what's happening you need to go talk to reed and he'll you know he'll take care of the thymoglobulin order for you mm -hmm. or 
or he'll tell you what you need to do, right? I'm just going to bring up hypocrisy. <laughs> 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 hypocrisy is good for a lot of basic drugs, <laughs> not for the transplant drugs. Just talk to Reed. <laughs> Use your inpatient yeah. pharmacist who, I mean, it, I mean it, especially on these, these specialized services that, you know, have drugs that aren't prescribed on every service that, I mean, use the people who, who make them, mix them, compound them, have studied them, know the effects, know what to mix them in. I mean, use them because I think that's, that Reed has been, like I have probably harassed Reed so much over my five <laughs> years in residency. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> in terms of <laughs> being we'll on, the on the transplant service. Hey Reed, I got a question. So, and I think that's knowing that, you know, that you can count on on those those folks on your team is important. Usually, if you harass me for five minutes, it's much easier to take care of than having to clean it up on, on mm -hmm. the back end. On the back end, yeah, that's happened. I'd, I'd much rather take five minutes out of my day to, to say, "Look, this is what we need to do," than than get in in the morning and be like, "Oh no, what happened?" <clears throat> when you anticipate a discharge, is that done after after afternoon rounds? <sighs> when maybe the work, you know, there are fewer people there, or is it in the morning? Or is it in the morning? It's been a year since I've been on this service, and that's a definite no. Or is it in the morning, yeah, when, when the full complement of, of the team is there? So my opinion is discharge planning should start at the time the patient is admitted. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Um, there's a little bit of a difference in the world that we live in, and the world that we wish we were <clears throat> so that doesn't always happen but that's that's what I try to do with my job is I might be asking you what the dispo is for a patient that's tubed in the unit mm -hmm. and having people can be like he's tubed in the unit he's not going anywhere but guess what I've seen these people turn around 48 hours and everybody be like you know he doesn't need rehab he's doing just fine we <laughs> yeah. want to send him yeah. home today do you have his meds and his education ready <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> you know so we're you know uh, I think our team in general, you're going to have multiple people kind of pushing you as far as like, yeah. so what's a dispo? What's a dispo? What's a dispo? Every what's day. A dispo? Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. And, and, and so, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just, that's kind of always, that's part of our job and something that's always in the back of our minds and it's part of us trying to plan mm -hmm. um, ahead of time to, mm -hmm. to smooth the entire process. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and questions about disposition, you know, they're important because it, it's really about the patient mm. and reducing hospital costs, really, mm -hmm. in the end. Yeah. The patients have to stay an extra night because of a yeah. medication that's delayed. Because there's always patients waiting to come mm -hmm. in. Yes, but, you know, there are. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for that conversation there. The next question is how, so do you buy into collective leadership to deliver optimal patient care or do you think there's a primary leader on the transplant team? I've heard, you know, everybody's an expert at what they do, and you go to that person for, for, for knowledge. So is it a collective group that takes care of the transplant patient, or is there really a primary leader? I think it's collective, mm -hmm. especially on the transplant service, for sure. Um, there are times where, sure, the surgical part is over, and maybe, their critical care needs aren't uh, or have resolved. Um, however, they're still needing the expertise of you know the transplant, the renal transplant service, or the hepatologists because we, you know their renal function isn't optimal yet. And from a surgical standpoint, we can't do anything else to make it better. And you know, it, it absolutely 100%. It's collective, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always thought of it as a this this beautiful marriage of medicine and surgery. And mm -hmm. I've never I think it's probably best you'll see anywhere in the hospital how these two completely different entities merge, and really the patient is the <coughs> ultimate benefit of that. And so and and it's and it's sometimes it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's all medicine and the uh, nephrologist and the hepatologist are kind of leading the drive, and then something surgical happens, and okay, and that goes. So it's really a great. Uh, working in orchestration with each other. So there is a conductor, I would say, probably the, the head surgeon on the team, but uh, but certainly everybody is the symphony. Yeah, uh, and 
Going at it from just like a different angle, I think that the intern has uh, a very strong role as potentially the leader of the team who might not have all of the surgical skill and medical knowledge that everybody else has, but he has all of the knowledge and everything that's going on with that particular patient. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who's communicating with GI or uh, G transplant, mm -hmm. hepatology, transplant mm -hmm. nephrology, pharmacy, social work, mm -hmm. everybody. He's mm -hmm. communicating with everybody all day, all the time. Mm -hmm. And you're the only person in that capacity to have that responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in some respects, the intern has um, the role as potentially the leader of the team um, and certainly the strongest advocate for the strong patient care. It's definitely a team. I mean, you, know, you can have a perfect surgery, a perfect donor. Um, if the patient doesn't know when um, he's to take his medication or what his medication's for, then he will be back in rejection. So, of course, it, 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 is, it is a team effort, and um, communicating to the patient and teaching the patient before the patient goes home is, is key. I think it's a, it's a real example of if, if anybody really feels strongly about something, like, hey, this guy really just shouldn't go home today. Right, it's just I just it's, he needs another day. We need he needs his social support here, or he needs there's 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 something going on. We're like, look, it's just he needs he's not ready. And if even if everyone else you know is like, well, I think he's okay. I think he's okay. I think he's okay. And there's one person on the team that's like, look, mm -hmm. we really have to keep this guy, or whatever it is, or, or you know this patient. That we we just need to keep him. People respect that, and I'm like, all right, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> I understand where you're coming from. We'll sort it out and do it tomorrow. Um, you know, at the same time, I think with discharges, you know, we definitely do not want people in the hospital any longer than they absolutely have to be. So if someone's going to push that button, they still better have a pretty good reason why they're saying it, right? So, <clears throat> you know, we're going to be getting trying to get people out as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and, and, and the intern is, is one of those big central mm -hmm. cogs. If that intern doesn't turn, nobody's going mm -hmm. anywhere. That's a very good point. Any other comments there? So you're saying the intern is actually kind of an advocate for the patient as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, so they step up and be that, know that's your role, and feel yep. confident in that. And the intern not only knows people on the ward, but in the ICU too, because they Everybody. take call yep. at night. <coughs> yeah, and I think the new interns who are starting, they should realize mm -hmm. it because oftentimes interns seem that, you know, they're just doing, they're just putting in orders, mm -hmm. taking orders from people, not really doing doctor work, mm -hmm. but, you know, this side of it is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many times they're the most important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd been um, with one of the liver transplant patients and families, I'd been working with them a lot, and I talked to one of the interns, and he told me that at 1 a.m., he went in there for an update. The patient was still intubated in the ICU, and then the caregivers were crying just because the patient's <coughs> intubated, and it's a scary time. And he stated, normally it's social work that there's a lot of tears, they're crying, we're consoling them. This intern told me that at 1 a.m., and he wasn't gloating, but he just said for one hour he stayed there, and he went, uh, you know, uh, moment by moment, you know, give it 48 hours, you know, they just had surgery but just consoling them and very empathetic and I told him I said he's a little social worker you know on the inside because he was just very <laughs> but he stayed for one hour and just consoled them and walked them through and of course the patient made a meaningful recovery and is do, do, uh, doing well right now but I was just really impressed that this intern you know uh, did my job it seemed like and you know when I wasn't able to be there in the middle of light, in the middle of the night they were there um, assisting and, and being that empathetic ear so I really appreciated that. Yeah. Any other comments? So how does the team ensure patient-centered care in which the patient really shares in clinical decision making? Talking to the patient. Mm -hmm. Like, don't just make plans in your head or within your team talk to the patient, explain why you are doing that, what are their thoughts, what are their concerns. Sure. I think that has helped me a lot mm -hmm. in taking good care of my patients. Mm -hmm. And so many times you talk to patients and maybe it's somebody that got transferred from another hospital mm -hmm. and you're asking them, well, you know, what were they thinking when they did this? And they have no clue. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's and, it's, and it's really frustrating because the documentation from the other hospitals mm-hmm. subpar. And, um, you know, I think that informing your patient, exactly like Alina said, is critical to putting all the pieces together because they're going to be, when, when the resident and all of us are gone, they're still going to have that story. Well, this is what happened. These are the problems they encountered <coughs> after surgery. Yeah. And this is what they did to fix it. And they can tell their primary care doctor and you know whoever else they're seeing. And it just brings more people into the fold and uh, is better able to give an accurate picture of what happened. Also giving them, it's difficult to do. We don't have crystal balls, but giving them the best, the whole gamut of best versus, you know, this could be a 24 hour process, this could be week long, a month long, so that they have a reasonable range in terms of their expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, They've obviously, once we get to the transplant service, they've obviously been extensively counseled and I mean, everything has been done behind the scenes in terms of not inpatient. However, on any other service where you might be taking care of emergency general surgery or patients or acute CHF exacerbation or you know whatever, I think giving them a reasonable idea of you know, hey, this is how it could go. It could be this good. It could be this bad. Not to scare you, but this is a reasonable range of what could happen, and we just need to take it a day at a time. Um, I think that's that's important. Managing family expectations is really key because a lot of that will spill over into patients' (laughs) overall happiness and well-being and Mm -hmm. uh, recovery. So I think, you know, a a lot of times if the patient was down in the operating room or whatnot, I'd try to swing by and talk to the family and just say, look, when they come back, they're going to be intubated, they're going to have a bunch of tubes and lines, and they're going to be hooked up to the ventilator and you know they're going to be on multiple pressors and you know that's normal that is expected that is not something out of the ordinary Mm -hmm. and if it's better than that then it's better than that but that's baseline so you know helping them to understand what what to expect because that first shock when you see your family member come back is um can be quite devastating do you think those discussions happen with the very first visit in the, you know, for a preoperative evaluation? Or are they so Probably. overwhelmed with that first day of evaluation that they never hear those things? Uh, at least on the transplant team, I mean, as residents, we were never there uh, in yeah. clinic to <coughs> see those uh, discussions take place. I've been on other rotations where they're very much uh, part of it how much the patient or the family understands um, is variable and I think reminding them throughout the course or throughout the plan up until you know when it actually happens um, can just kind of help solidify everything. Um, Like David said we are not in the transplant clinic but if you read the transplant clinic letters and their documentation I think there is ample discussion whatever yeah Yeah. what the patient perceives out of it is different because you know sometimes patients come very well prepared their families are all you know up to date with what's going to happen and sometimes they have no clue so i think some of it has to do with the perception of the patient and their family as well so well it's a time frame too so from evaluation to listing to transplant it could be two years, it could be six months, and so they're evaluated by the whole multidisciplinary team. So social work does the psychosocial, mm-hmm. they meet with the surgeon, their notes are in, you know, in, in the medical record, the whoever the attending is, the hepatologist or the nef- nephrologist. So it's a very extensive, and social workers, we get that a lot, like nobody ever told me that I'm, because I'm from El Paso, I have to stay here for two to four weeks. Nobody ever told me I had to be on anti-rejection medications. For the rest of my life, nobody ever told me that. So. <laughs> You know, and we try, right? Yeah, right. They've been, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They've been they had a class, you know, it's multiple. We give them a whole sheet of all the medications, like, so it's multiple, you know, it's extensive education. However, the time frame, you know, I ask them, you know, when were you, how long have you been listed? Oh, I was listed for two years, or I was listed for two weeks. So with each organ, it's, and there's a lot of variables, but sometimes that time frame from eval to listing to transplant is a very long period of time. But, um, but then we just try to, on the inpatient side, reiterate every single thing again. But 
I think transplant's a little bit <clears throat> different because, you know, the the transplant, I think, is something that people have been waiting for. A lot of people celebrate that date like it's a second birthday. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so many of these people are waiting on the list and waiting on the list and waiting on the list. And that phone call yeah. is something that they have been waiting for, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, this is, <clears throat> this is a, a divine intervention type thing, right? And so they've been waiting for this phone call. And so there, many of them are in the hospital for an event that they've been looking forward to, not something that happened, you know, mm -hmm. to them. And so... <clears throat> They're a little bit more vested in it at mm -hmm. that point in time. The other thing is, in, in, as a pharmacist, obviously, I'm biased towards medications, but, um, <clears throat> you know, the drugs are keeping them alive. And so without their buy-in to that treatment regimen and that, and that therapy, if they don't buy into it, they're not doing anybody any favors from transplanting them because they're not going to be adherent to it. Um, and so part of what, you know, we do is we sit down and talk to them and explain to them that, you know, these are very important medications and, um, you know, if you have questions, we're here for you, show them that we're as vested in their well-being as they are, right? You, you've been, tra you know, you're here, you're with us, you're part of the family. Mm -hmm. If you need something from us, ask and, you know, we will do our best to to get you back to doing the things you want to do we want you to play with your grandkids we want you to see your daughters get married we want you to be able to travel and play golf and go fishing um and whatever it is you want to do our goal is to get you there right mm -hmm. and, and so we're going to give you the tools but you still have to use them and be bought into that therapy so many times, if they know why they're taking the medicine, they'll yeah. go, oh, yeah. well, then I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, they're all important. They always have yeah. the rejection ones. <laughs> yeah. Those are important. But there's also, we want your blood pressure controlled or your diabetes controlled. Yeah. So if they know what a particular medicine is for, and most things only take a few minutes to explain in a language the patients can understand, mm -hmm. most things can be explained with just in a few minutes, and then they, then they totally buy in. Most yeah. of them have already bought in because they've received your training and all that before when they get to the clinic. It's like, well, this is the one that prevents this. Oh, okay. I don't like that, so I'll take yeah. that. No. Yeah. And then they usually say, that's the little pink pill? Yeah. 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 And then they yeah. say, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then the residents say, I have no idea. No. Yeah. <laughs> Here's yeah. the picture of maybe. Exactly. <laughs> Here's the black and white picture that I have in my pocket. So it looks like written on a prescription. Yeah. 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 That's my blood pressure goes. <laughs> So how does a transplant team reduce medical errors? We've talked about some of these things already, already but and do you have some examples where the team was successful to do that? I think the pre-education is mm -hmm. so vital. What yeah. they do is the patient education. I can tell in the clinic if somebody hasn't been to the class mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when the patients know what to expect and also, um, but as this whole theme of this whole day has been just communication, really, mm -hmm. just absolute. Um, not only if they know why they're taking, they're gonna know when something's wrong. I had a person bring in pills yesterday, two different manufacturers for the same pill. And and he said, uh, "Are these, is this the right pill? And the thing that hit me was, somebody told him if that was different, to let us see it. And, and it certainly it was the same medicine, just two different manufacturers, both ProGraph, one milligram. But but that person was trained to do that. Yeah. And that eliminated sure. a potential error. Yeah, that's good. Ahead of time, no? From an, from an intern resident perspective, um, among your entire residency, I think there has to be an attitude towards complete excellence and a minutia attention to detail, mm -hmm. yeah. where especially in critically, um, excuse me, in critically ill patients or patients recovering from a major surgery, very small things can become very big things, and uh, letting those snowball can uh, be absolutely devastating to the patients, to your residency, um, and you know to the overall transplant team in general. Um, and that that just has to be from the start. You actually you have to have a, a mindset towards excellence um, and bring it every single day. Um, during my training, one incident that I recall, it wasn't necessarily in the transplant <coughs> team, the medical error that I have encountered, um, it happened because of lack of communication. Mm -hmm. 
there were multiple teams involved in taking care of a patient and I thought I had communicated to the person who needed to know that information, but they did not transfer the knowledge to the person who actually mm-hmm. needed the information. So the patient ended up getting a procedure that they did not need. Mm-hmm. So that was quite a big deal. And what I learned from that episode was that um, always think of the steps where the communication can <coughs> fall apart mm-hmm. and try to think of ways to circumvent it even before it happens. So what I could have done is gone one step forward to communicate to the person who actually needed that information. Mm -hmm. So communication. Mm -hmm. We have order sets. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the order sets. We have order sets. Oh my Please use the order sets. <laughs> Amen. And protocols and built in redundancies mm-hmm. and, and and all of us are there if you need us for a resource. Mm-hmm. But we do have order sets. <laughs> and, and and use your head. <laughs> and use your head. Because yeah. there's for every rule there's an exception and uh they're definitely out there. So ask, always ask yourself, is this the correct anything? And if you do that and you live by that, then you know patients are gonna do okay. I found that um, last year was a, being the, the chief resident on the service, or on any service, the amount of neuroses on the chief residence part <laughs> with regards to the patient care and how things are done on the team is inversely proportionate <laughs> to the medical error that is incurred. <laughs> um, and so I think with that, it, like you said, attention to detail, striving for excellence, but m- there are never, you know, oh, hey, David, make sure that X, Y, and Z, okay, Tatiana. That's usually the answer that I'd get from him, but you know what? One time, I know there was maybe one out of every 10 times that he was like, oh, I'm so glad she said that, I almost forgot. You know? <laughs> the, it, instead of like, Absolutely. you know, it, yeah. in the, when I walk away rolling your eyes, which is totally fine, because I did it too, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, I think that on every level is, is important. Be mentally healthy, but <laughs> very little of what we do is. Yeah. I've seen I've seen in the outpatient clinic when they'll come they'll be admitted to either our hospital or somebody else's. I've seen errors where they came in with their medicines that they're on. Some of them were held for infection or whatever reason, and then they may have even had a prolonged stay. So then by the time they discharge, they go, okay, here's what we want them on. I think it's important to go back and say, what did they come in on mm-hmm. and make sure we capture all those things also. Um, and then anti rejection medicine, of course, is, is cri- critical. And if the patient doesn't get something restarted on their way out and there's not good communication there, then the patient's not going to take the drug and come in with a problem. Sure. Unfortunately, I've, I've seen that. Yeah, we've, we've started um, on the de novo discharges. Uh, we update the medication mm-hmm. list, and then all the intern has to do is copy mm-hmm. over sure. there on the readmissions, you know, a year later or sometime. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you do what you can, but, you know, so, so a lot of those on the surgery service, we're, we're doing a lot of that medication stuff to decrease mm-hmm. the errors so that we make them both their patient-specific med list and the hospital discharge orders, mm-hmm. and so that all that matches up. Um, for the interns, we've, we've started doing that, and that, mm-hmm. that's decreased, I think, some of the errors. <coughs> Changing gears just a little bit here, do you think um, interprofessional collaboration is best taught in the classroom with simulation when you're with different disciplines or really in a real life clinical setting? I think you start building the bases mm-hmm. in classroom, sure. but you really learn the ropes when mm-hmm. you are a PGY1 mm-hmm. on July 1st. Sure. That's when the full impact uh-huh, of it yes. <laughs> hits you and you realize what you're dealing yes. with. It's real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I agree. Um, I think you don't necessarily, you don't know what you don't know until right. you know it. Right. And so <laughs> knowing it is, is what you get when, you're, when you start July 1. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know what you don't know and you're like, 
oh, holy cow, I need to dose this or I need to figure out how to do this or, you know, it, you don't really learn a lot of dosing in medical school of drugs and, and you know, how to replace potassium necessarily. Like, that's not something that's frequently taught, I guess, you know, so... And you're expected to know that on the first... And, yeah, yeah you need to replace potassium. Like, mm -hmm. it happens, and so... You call the nurses to say, this is, you right. know, tell me right. what to do. <laughs> right, right, No, so so it's, you know, those things are, um, you know, you just sort of, you, you mm -hmm. learn. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. difficult to pick up, but mm -hmm. sure. it's a small example. But learning on the job is important. Well, what you said is so important. Listen to the nurses. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. They, yeah. they, I mean, that is critical. <laughs> you sure. are not... Nobody is just a anything. And yeah. The nurses are, are, they've been there, they've done that, and they know before you do what the patients need. Yep. And sure. so, and I have always, I, okay, I got that, thank you. Yes. And, you know, it's never, it, that's critical, especially in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah, when you're standing outside a critically ill patient's door yes. and you're looking at the ICU monitors mm -hmm. and there are all kinds of beepings going on and yeah. you have no clue, listen to the nurses. They might yes. drop a hint or two. Oh, they will absolutely. They'll flat yes. out tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you I hope. Absolutely. You do yeah. You need to do the, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They've been doing this a lot longer mm -hmm. than you have at that point. For sure. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. Then you bring them a soda later and say thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would like to see, I don't know anymore how much exposure, um, you know, medical students get to other professions, mm -hmm. you know, one-on-one -on -one or anything within the classroom. But, you know, I'd almost like to see labs where, you know, you bring in the pharmacy students mm -hmm. and mid-levels and, and whomever mm -hmm. and have them work on a case as a group and everyone can kind of see what everybody has to mm -hmm. offer, you know, within that. And then, you know, see it kind of go through so that when you get there on, Jan you know, July mm -hmm. 1, you're, yeah. you sure. kind of understand it. But, you know, <clears throat> most, most of the learning, I think, is, you know, you don't really know it until you do it. Mm -hmm. So sure. once you're, you're there, it's... Mm -hmm. You'll know at the second time do it. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know July 1, we're always like, so what are you trying to do here? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's your end goal? Let, let us help you get there. So one of our hepatologists goes on vacation every first week of July. <laughs> <laughs> his name's not, his name's not in the chart. I won't say his name. <laughs> you will not see it in the chart on the first week of July. <laughs> <laughs> so do occasional transplant surgery. Yeah, it's <laughs> literally gone. <laughs> you, 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 yeah. Those are the real, those yeah. are the senior ones. <laughs> hmm. So we're almost coming to the end of the hour here, but um, we might finish with this one last thing. So what final advice in just one sentence, it could just be one imperative, might you give to a new intern about promoting interprofessional collaboration for quality and safe patient care? Ask questions. Ask questions. Wonderful. Don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. This is actually a quote from Dr. Sigaroa that he gave a class years ago and that I've given many times to the PA student classes is the patient will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. So yeah. don't be afraid so to show the patients that you're, you're there for them. Mm -hmm. Erica? Um, ask questions, communicate. I mean, it's really communication. Yeah. Load the boat. Mm -hmm. Don't be the only person knowing a piece of information that you may or may not know whether it's important or not. Mm -hmm. Load the boat. Communicate with your chief. Communicate with your upper level. Communicate with your faculty. Communicate with pharmacists. With I mean, hey, is this important? Communicate and load the boat. I think it's the most important thing. I would say be respectful and know that each position is of equal value. I would say use your resources, you know, where we are many, we are knowledgeable, and we are there to help you succeed. Never alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we, if you pick up the phone and you call us, we will help you the best way we know how or, or, or steer you in the, in the right direction. <clears throat> I would say um, don't ever lose sight of the learning opportunities in the day-to-day -day activities of what you do and in the communications uh, and interactions you have with other people. Uh, it will serve you and it will make you an, a, a much happier person, not thinking that 
you know, this is beneath me or anything like that. You know, I think if you really understand why you're doing what you're doing, um, it's going to really serve you well. <coughs> So thank you all very much. I really appreciate this open, engaging conversation. Um, it will certainly help our new interns on the transplant team. So thank you all very much. Thank Thanks for having us. Thank you.